Katie Rose shares a beautiful alchemy between yoga, Ayurveda, mindful living and rituals that is bringing a sense of devotion or sacredness into everyday life. In this episode we go quite deep into the science of yoga and the ancient wisdom of yoga and what yoga truly means well beyond the physical postures or the asanas. We go into some of the details of the Australian seasons through the lens of Ayurveda as well as some of the indigenous or Aboriginal wisdom toward health and wellness. Katie is an advanced level yoga teacher and a wise earth Ayurveda master teacher. She is also qualified as a doula. Katie is the author of Mindful Living and is currently working on the Mindful Living Journal and the Mindful Living Oracle Cards. This collection is designed to nurture a life of connection, creativity, self-reflection and meditation. Hi, Katie, and welcome to the Lionheart Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It is such a pleasure. And to look at the work that you do, boy, there is such a scope. It's a bit like where to start, but I have an idea on where I would like to start. There is so much we can cover today on Ayurveda, yoga, mindfulness, meditation. But something I want to ask you is just coming back into the current times And I want to ask you, what have you been applying for yourself to get through? The other thing is I do know you have four children, four boys. How are you managing? How are you coping with lockdown and with everything that's been happening? Yeah, it's certainly been a big time. We've just had the news actually that the children will be going back to school full time from next week. So we're kind of emerging out of it, which is nice. And it's funny because it's like so many things. I feel like I've just found my groove. So I could kind of probably go on a little bit longer with having them at home if I needed to. But there were definitely some ups and downs there in the first few weeks were pretty intense. I realized quite early on that... I was going to have to be very mindful about really having some strategy around having the kids at home all of the time and also my own health and wellness physically, emotionally. It's a big undertaking for all of us and everybody's got their own complexities in the situation. It doesn't matter whether you've got kids or no kids or you're working or you're not working. You know, we're all going to have our own complex situation to navigate. You know, mine is what mine is with the children and I'm divorced from their father. He lives very close. So we're kind of shuffling between two houses. That's a whole process to navigate and then yeah just maintaining my own health and wellness within that and that's sort of an amplified version of the parenting journey anyway I think as a mum one of the things that you are constantly under pressure in some ways to do is find that balance between looking after children and really being available for them in every way but also looking after self and if you can't do that not really being able to look after the children so well so this was sort of like a more amplified version of that finding balance under new circumstances so really it was about keeping up with your yoga keeping up with meditation yeah it was very much about that and for me what I find is what works for me and of course everyone's different but what really works for me is being quite structured and quite ordered. So I have to set some really clear intentions and almost have some goals around very simple things like uh, what we're going to eat. You know, like I plan the meals and I plan the shopping, when we're going to exercise, what the exercise will look like. And because I've got four kids and they're all different ages, my eldest is 13 and my youngest is four, even strategizing around that is a thing. It's like, okay, if we're going to go for a run, We can all run faster than the four-year-old. So the four-year-old has to be on his little scooter keeping up. It's like just being very thoughtful about how logistically it can all work. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, just getting all the pieces to fit together. But for me, yeah, there was certainly diet was a big one because I think when you're at home all day, it's really easy to kind of snack and just not be particularly attentive to what you're eating. Keeping exercise and actually amplifying exercise, I found was really helpful. Getting out of the house a couple of times a day, doing my yoga practice every day. And then for me personally, I really need some alone time. So because my kids do go off to their dads, I get that time as well. And that's absolutely critical to my mental health just 
time where I don't have to talk to anyone. I don't have to respond to anything. I can just potter around. That's my favorite kind of time in the week or time in the day. It's just that quiet downtime at home where I don't, I'm not responding to stimulus. I'm just kind of in my own energy. I find that really rejuvenating. Why do you think it is so rejuvenating? And I'm with you on that one. And I definitely enjoy quiet time and deep practice of meditation. What do you think it is that happens within us that brings so much richness to mm. being? That's a good question. Alone? Yeah. I think it has a lot to do with the overstimulation that we're all suffering from. We're just information overload. You know, it's funny. I wrote a long email to a very good friend overseas this week, a friend of mine in the UK. I'm originally from England. And um, it was just a kind of long, rambling, chatty email. And as I was sending it, I had a moment of almost guilt or kind of doubting myself where I thought oh he's gonna have to read this and engage with it and mail back and I sort of had this sense of I'm adding to his burden of admin you know and that's sort of where we're at it's like even if you want to have a social call with a friend or reach out to someone in a, in a way that has nothing to do with work or your professional life but really just intimately connect with somebody there's sort of this sense that we're very, very overloaded. I'm extremely aware of how precious people's time and not just time, but energy engagement is. And by the same token, I'm very careful about where I put my energy and how much time I invest in particular things. Because I think the only way that any of us can be productive is to be very discerning, you know, discerning about how much time we spend on social media, who we're hanging out with. There's this beautiful word in the Sanskrit language satsang, which means the truth of the company that you keep. It's like who you hang out with. And I don't just mean that in person. That happens in the virtual space too. Who are you allowing into your energetic sphere, even inside your own head? You know, they may not even be around, but who is energetically in your presence and what impact does that have on your energy field is it uplifting is it depleting is it nourishing your soul is it draining your energy and so for me the alone time to go back to your question is very much about filtering all of that processing all of that and not pouring stuff in all the time that I'm having to then kind of assimilate but just sitting I mean that's what meditation practice is just sitting in what is and giving some time and space for assimilation it's for me it's by far the most powerful practice at this time of all the different practices I could be doing that alone time and meditation practice is what keeps me sane and I think it's to do with this overload it's to do with overload that we're all kind of experiencing the mind in itself is a mechanical overload isn't it and Unless we really learn how to feed it correctly or manage that, <laughs> it can get a little crazy. I'm with you and I really loved how you touched on even the energy and what we create within ourselves because we do, from within, we have a choice, don't we, as to how we respond to certain stimulus or certain environments. So just like this phenomena at the moment or this pandemic crisis, COVID-19, however we want to call it or label it, but the way we respond internally, we can manage that. Yeah, I mean, it's all a choice. It may not feel like a choice, but I think ultimately one of the most powerful spiritual teachings that are available to any one of us is this idea that you have no control whatsoever around what happens to you, but you can control how you choose to respond to it. And the more foundation of a spiritual practice that each one of us has the more connection to something bigger than ourselves the easier it is to have a skillful response it's really a training it's like we're we're more readily available to respond skillfully to the unknown and to being in the state of fear and to not being able to control external events mm. by being able to control internal events so when did this all begin for you and how I, I mean you started yoga and a yoga studio called samadhi yes a long time ago how did the yoga the blessings of yoga enter your life and at such a young age well yeah. for the western world perhaps at such a young age i, I could say yeah <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think my story is a little bit different to many because a lot of the people that I speak to who are yoga teachers now and people who I train to become yoga teachers or Ayurvedic practitioners 
are coming at it as a second career. It's a pretty common path now to become a little bit disillusioned with what you've been doing perhaps or want to add an extra side income or side work to what you're doing and train in yoga. But for me, it's actually been all I've ever done. I left school pretty young. I walked away from an academic career or an academic path, even though I am quite academically inclined as a person, and just had this deep fascination with the yogic teachings, Eastern teachings. I went to India super young as a teenager and spent time there in ashrams and traveling around and studying and meditating and doing yoga and really haven't stopped. Who knows even where that comes from? It hasn't come from really my cultural background or from my parents or anything like that. It's a random wild card, but it certainly has been a set of teachings that has served me in my life. And I, perhaps that's one of the reasons why it's stuck because I come back to these teachings again and again. And frankly, they keep me sane. They keep me grounded and able to show up in the world and do all the things that I do in service of others. So yeah, it's a path that's working for me. Mm. What is yoga for you? Because, and having experienced yoga in India, what is yoga? That's a big question. Ultimately, Yoga is often defined as the connection within the self of the mind, the body, and the spirit. And I see that as a fairly narrow and not very expansive perception. The word yoga means to unite, to bind two things together. And in my experience and my understanding of scripture and of Sanskrit, what we're really talking about is the unification, the uniting of the self, the individual, with greater consciousness. We can call that God, you might call it Krishna, you might call it universal power. I mean, there's lots of different names we can give that. I think often when we use the word God, people have an immediate connotation to that, which may or may not be positive or may or may not resonate. But ultimately, the practices of yoga and the practices that I have dedicated my life to are all about remembering that I am just a tiny, tiny insignificant ant in the grand scheme of the universe and I'm just a little like fragment of dust from the greater consciousness and from the greater manifest experience which again which we could call God and the other side to that is also as westerners when we speak in that way and we talk about our smallness and our insignificance sometimes what happens is people get confused and they think that means that the teaching is suggesting that we're not important and it's not that Because actually what we do is we acknowledge that the smallest speck of dust or the tiniest ant is as significant as any other living being. We all hold balance, the juxtaposition of both. It's like sitting in our sacredness and absolutely astounding beauty and sitting in the mundane and the insignificance and the tininess of us. The very first yoga sutra, Atta Yoga Anushasanam from Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, really speaks to this. He speaks to Anu, which means tiny, really small. And then he speaks to yoga, which means the biggest that you can imagine. And he suggests that it's like the microcosm and the macrocosm. We are both at the same time. We're both vast, expansive light beings. And we are also not as important as we think we are. You know, there's a lot of ego that is unhelpful. So to me, that's what yoga is. It's like being able to sit between those two places and somehow be comfortable with them or kind of cope with them. I was reading something. I don't know if you've read the book Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. Have you read that book? Such a great book. I love, you know, Elizabeth Gilbert, she wrote Eat, Play, Pray, Love. And yeah, yeah, I love her. She's awesome. And so she was, in her book Big Magic, she talks about whether people are optimists or pessimists and whether we see the world as, you know, is the glass half full or half empty kind of thing. And she's talking about it in relationship to creativity. And the conclusion that she comes to, and I love this, I just... For me, this is just the perfect kind of interpretation. She says, the glass is both half full and half empty. You know, we're abundantly creative. We're magnificent. We're incredible. And we're really average (laughs) in every moment. And I see that in myself and I see that in others. And yeah, that's what yoga is to me. 
For me, it's what you're saying is the essence of non-judgment, not judging our judgments, <laughs> and also very clear perception and involvement of everything as one. That's exactly it. You can't judge. When you start to see yourself in others and you see others in you and you see your jealousy and you see your petty mindedness and you see your preferences but you also see your great integrity and your capacity and all the things that you're amazing at when you can truly make that assessment of self then you'll stop being as judgmental towards others because there's no need for it it's I mean I'm speaking to this as if I've nailed it and I'm like doing it it's not that trust me like if you see me parenting in the last eight weeks with my kids at home, you would not be thinking this woman is living every moment according to the yogic principles. But I understand them. I'm attempting in a heartfelt way to embody them in my life. Mm, mm. So I have read some of the yoga sutras and from what I've seen is we don't really nail it as in the full liberation doesn't really arrive until we fully leave this body for good <laughs> isn't that the dissolution of karma so really we're always learning and growing that's and so exactly right and so much more than that so you've really described yoga in a beautiful way um right to its depth and in the west there really is a big focus on the physical aspects of yoga so this must have a huge role to play as well in the union that you describe. Can you share a little about that, the physical practice as well as the perhaps meditative and expanded awareness that you've already touched on? Yeah, sure. In the yogic philosophy that I follow, there are, rather than just having one body, you know, most of us identify with one physical body in this lifetime. We're taught that there are five bodies. So the Anamaya Kosha is the physical body and that's what the yoga asana, the physical postures are a practice for or relate to but we also have each one of us has an energy body and that's where we find things like the chakras and the meridians if you're into traditional chinese medicine that the way that prana or energy flows in the body chi and then we have the emotional body the realm of feelings and emotions and then the mental body and those two are separate so my logical rational mind is quite separate to my emotional feeling experience according to the teachings of yoga and this is really important because i mean if we put it in really simplistic terms in terms of western psychology we sometimes talk about the idea of the head and the heart mm. you know your head might tell you something very sensible and logical and sort of linear but the heart might tell you something completely different and it's what which one of those we choose to engage with and some people live their lives very much identified with the emotional body not really caring so much about the mental body, the mind, and others the other way. I was talking to a friend yesterday who has been years and he's pushing for them to move in together and his partner's not ready. And he was describing that he is ready to just throw caution to the wind and he just wants to move in and he's in love and it doesn't matter about which house they live in and how much the rent is and all those kinds of things. But his partner is very hesitant and wondering about where they'll live and how they'll live and what the rent will be. And so it's a perfect example. He's just living in what we call Vinyana Maya Kosha, my friend, which is the emotional, just like, I love you and I want to live with you and who cares about the logistics? And then his partner's very much in Manamaya Kosha, which is, let's be practical here. How's this going to work? And the truth is that we have to balance all of those, that both elements are really important, as well as physical body as well as energy body. It's a lot to think about. And then the fifth body is the spirit soul. The spirit soul is the part of us that is beyond name, beyond form, beyond personality. It's the essence of who we are. It's a little bit different. That's kind of in a separate section. But those first four, any given moment, like right now as I'm speaking to you and you're speaking to me, your physical body, your energy body, your emotions and your mind are all engaged at any given time. At any given time, one of them might take precedence. So if there's pain in the physical body that's going to affect all the other bodies you know if you're in physical pain that will impact your mind your emotions your energy if the physical body is easeful and comfortable then other elements might be kind of raising up and dropping down and i think of it like a dance it's like a dance where we're constantly balancing these different facets of the self and 
physical body and the yoga practices that support the physical body is super important, but not the whole picture. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be yoga asana, I don't think. I think as long as your body is being kept well and your energy is being kept optimum, you know, you might swim, you might walk, you might run. It's not so important that it has to be the yoga asana practice. You might practice Tai Chi or some other modality. But if you don't pay any attention to physical body, in time, you'll start to notice that there's a deterioration of wellness in all the other bodies as well. Well, there is that good old saying, it is the home for the soul. <laughs> home yeah. for the yeah, or even the temple, you know, the, it's like the body is the temple. Yeah, as we want to take care of our homes and nurture, <laughs> very, yeah, important, very important too. Balancing all facets of self, you mentioned, I thought very much to me is a state of mindful awareness. That you've written a book, Living Mindfully. I have. So, really, this is would you say this living mindfully or what you write about is about becoming aware of all those facets of self including the non-physical, the soul that you refer to, as well as mind emotions. There was one thing that did come to mind, my mind <laughs> as you were speaking. You mentioned about mind and emotions. Now, from what I've always seen is a thought triggers an emotion, so I don't see how they're, they're not, they are connected because mm. it's like where the mind goes, the body follows. And when you speak of energy, this is a combination of all energies, right? Thoughts, emotions something that emanates from us. Yeah. They're all living and interacting within each other all the time, like a network or a web. I often think of it like the image of the spider's web, that each strand is kind of, or DNA, you know, it's perfectly in resonance with each other. And the impact of one area will ripple out into all areas. So you're absolutely right. There is no real separation. However, generally speaking, and this is a generalization, but generally speaking in Western culture, we prioritize the mental faculty, the mind over the emotional realm. And it's often to our detriment. And I think that this is one of the reasons why people are suffering so greatly in terms of mental health. What's actually going on for many people is it's not the mental health that's the problem, it's the spiritual health. We ignore our soul's longing. We ignore our intuition. Mm. And this leads to disconnect, which is profound. You know, you can live a whole life in denial and suppression of what in Sanskrit would be called your dharma, the longing of your heart, whatever that might be, because of external pressure, whether they're pressures that come from society or your parents or the partner that you've chosen or whatever it might be external conditions. And I truly believe this, that there's a responsibility for each one of us incarnate as human beings to tune into what is it I'm actually here to do? What's the essence of what I'm here to do? And that's not always your vocation. It's who am I here to be in this lifetime? And each one of us will have unique gifts. And sometimes those will be seen as very positive And sometimes they're more confronting, they're more challenging. I mean, I can give you an example because that sounds a bit esoteric, but like if I think about myself, my personality type is very direct, right? So the downside of that is that sometimes I can be really super impatient, angry. I'll tell it like it is. I just really can be a bit too much. But the plus side of that is if you come to me and ask me for an opinion or you want some advice or you need some clarity, I'm really, really going to be helpful at helping you cut through all the side stuff and tune into what is going on here. Whereas another person may not have that skill or that karma in this lifetime. They might be a person who's really good at looking at all the nuance and all the subtlety and all the different ins and outs of a situation. They don't have that decisive fire energy. They have a much more water-like, empathetic, compassionate, subtle way of looking. And that could be equally as helpful in a different context. In fact, for me, it's really important to have friends that have that energy because otherwise I'd just be like a bull in a china shop blasting through my life, blowing things up, you know? So it's like that. We've each got these different gifts. And often they're not necessarily about what we do in the world. They're about who we are and how we are in the world. And ultimately, if we can celebrate those and honor them, we're going to be a lot healthier. You know, our mental health, emotional health, spiritual health, even physical health will be much more robust if we can live in alignment with that. And I think about that in the context of parenting too, 
it's like I look at my children and I hope that I am able to honor that in them you know that they've each got completely different personalities completely different karma and exactly what you said before how do I come to it without judgment so one kid is less motivated one kid is really sporty one kid is very placid and gentle how do I honor all of those things and respect them and acknowledge them without judging it's a big job (laughs) you answered my question you know as you were speaking of balancing the, all the facets I was thinking to ask you so how do you bring this into your parenting seeing this level of awareness into giving that passing that on to your own children and that must mm. yeah that was a, I thought that would be a lot of value to a lot of people who have children yeah. <laughs> well everybody yeah. who has children I think there is one other thing I'd say about that and you know it doesn't just relate to children it could be in your relationships it could be in your workplace colleagues it's actually basically any interaction you have with any other human being it goes back to satsang exactly what we were talking about before the people that you are surrounded with it's useful to make sure that you're not only choosing people that are the same as you so for example I mean, actually, a good example of this is, again, social media. We end up in these little bubbles because of the algorithms where everything we're being fed and everything we're reading and seeing is in alignment with what we think and feel. So one thing I've done recently in lockdown is I've actually been listening to a little bit more conservative right-wing radio and a couple of political podcasts that are much more aligned with the right, which is not my political preference at all. But it's so valuable and powerful to see the world through someone else's lens. I think it's a spiritual responsibility, actually, that we don't just let ourselves get closed into more and more tightly these little bubbles of our own reality. And same with the parenting journey. I've tried, and again, I don't want to make it sound like I've perfected this because it's all a work in progress, but I've tried quite hard with my children to make sure they have role models in their lives of people who are very different to me so that they get to see that life is full of variety. And even their father, you know, to celebrate in him the differences between us and nurture in the children the capacity to see my mum and dad are really different and they're both great people. And to see the, the differences and the strengths and the weaknesses and for that to be okay, that we don't all have to be the same. And then I guess they find that's all okay within themselves as well. And it brings an innate sense of peace and acceptance. Yeah. Of self exactly it. and yeah. others. That's really beautiful, Katie. That's really, really beautiful. I want to ask about Ayurveda because that seems, is it some kind of, has it been, was it an extension of yoga for you? How did that come about? And perhaps you could tell us a little bit about Ayurveda. Sure. It's absolutely an extension of everything we've just been speaking about. What Ayurveda does is it gives a language and it gives a framework for the conversation that we've been having already. So it says each person has their own unique constitutional type. In Ayurveda, we call that your dosha. And that unique constitutional type will have a combination of many different facets within it. So it's elemental. You may be more of a fiery type person. That's me. I've already described that. Mm -hmm. You may be more earthy. You may have more water, more air, but also your constitutional type will be impacted by things like where you grew up, the period in history that you were born into, your parents. I mean, so many different things, so many different elements that make up who you are. And then Really what Ayurveda does is it gives us tools and practices with which to work with those different facets. So for example, if you're a very earthy person, in Ayurveda we call that kapha, the earth energy. Again, it's traits that might be perceived as being positive and traits that might not be so positive. So kapha is very steady, loyal, consistent, grounded, reliable, like beautiful container of energy but if it tips too far into getting stuck kapha can become depressed lazy and really fearful of change so it's like we try to cultivate enough of that energy that we get the positives but not so much that we get stuck in the imbalance 
And so, again, it's this constant dance of kind of like finding balance within ourselves and within our relationships. And you can do that through so many different ways, through the food that you're eating, the exercise that you're doing, the people that you're spending time with, what you're spending your time doing. All of those things have a big impact on how you are in the five bodies that we've already spoken about. And you speak of air and fire and water and earth. So really, we're all made up of these. These are the elements. I mean, these are nature's elements. And we're all made up of all of them. I think what you're saying in Ayurveda is some of them are more prominent in us than in others, yes? And can you pick, you could probably perceive in a relatively short amount of time the main dosha in a person when you first meet them, can you? Or does that happen for you now When because you, you know this? It's, yeah, I mean, I've been doing this work for over 20 years. It's very much part of how I see the world now. Like it's part oh. of the lens through which I see the world. And it's not so much that I can pick it up on a person and sort of make a judgment about that person as they are all the time. In a particular context, I can pick it up. So for example, I mean, to go back to the parenting example, I can see in my children if we've been out on the beach all day and it's the middle of summer in Sydney and everyone is like hot and a bit dehydrated and, you know, a lot of noise and stimulation and that's pitta energy, that's the fire energy in Ayurveda. When we get home at the end of a day like that, it's going to be helpful for me to do things that are cooling grounding let's put some peppermint oil in the diffuser let's have a cool shower let's drink lots of fluids let's have an early night like all those sort of grounding cooling calming things that's working with the energy in the opposite way on the other hand in lockdown when everyone's getting sort of a bit stagnant and like you know too much time on screens and we're all just on top of each other then we need to shift the energy in the other way and get out and go for a bike ride or go for a run or play in the park and just burn off some energy. So it's sort of like that constant dance of playing with where everyone's at and working to balance that. It's in a big family, it's harder because often what happens is different people are in different places at different times. And so then you're kind of juggling. And I thought about that actually with the lockdown situation, I've been thinking so much about school teachers and how they are the most underpaid and under regarded Mm -hmm group of professionals like you know I just renewed respect and admiration for school teachers and the job of balancing the energy of a room full of 20 kids or 25 kids who are all in different places with that stuff is huge that's a phenomenal job Mm. and I feel like teachers who are really skilled at their job that's what they're doing they're managing these energies all the time they're keeping the kids focused or letting them burn off steam or it's like constantly working with the vibe of the collective a lot of emotional energy I would imagine working with that many children well kids have no filter you know we as adults we have a social filter so we might I might be feeling really irritated or feeling really tired or whatever but I'm not going to necessarily act out like I'm going to have some sort of social filter to moderate that whereas kids it's like whatever's going on they're just in the moment living it out And they have a wisdom and connection about them because one of my dearest friends is a teacher for very young, young age children. And some of the wisdom, the things that she tells me they say (laughs) that we tend to forget because of this disconnect that happens, as you spoke of earlier, the wisdom that they bring, they're quite Mm. enlightened, (laughs) really. They really are because they're pure spirits it's like you know like i just said they're not working with what is socially acceptable or what they're meant to be they don't have ideas around that they're just clear channels Mm. none of that sort of protected ego so identity is not that well developed so there's a authenticity and clarity that comes with that boundlessness really and you do this Well, I've had a good look through your Ayurvedic goddess course and there just seems to be so much wisdom in that. And I I also noticed you spoke just now in beautiful detail about some Ayurveda wisdom. Are there rituals as well? There must be sort of more like some sort of practice as well. Is there is that? If you could mention a bit of that. But what really grabbed me (laughs) in looking through the notes on your course was the unique Australian seasons through the lens of Ayurveda as well as Aboriginal approaches to health and wellness. I love this integration of native wisdom. Well, really, I guess 
Ayurveda, yoga, everything we've spoken about so far is ancient wisdom and then now you're bringing in native it's all really ancient mm. as well please share a little about this yeah so i had started to study ayurveda before i moved to australia from the uk and i understood that according to ayurveda there are six seasons rather than four because the transition seasons between as we move out of autumn and then again as we move out of spring are considered unique seasons in themselves so the transition time is like a short little season which is actually really important because what happens in that transition is cleansing and a recalibrating so the transitions of the seasons are a really great time to fast or um, do a juice cleanse and just recalibrate your body ready for the next season so it's like a pause a breath between and when I moved to Australia from the UK it took me a while actually I grew up in the countryside in England and I was really in love with the natural environment in England I really enjoyed the seasons I loved spending time looking at the different flowers and trees and just following the way that nature's cycle worked that was really a powerful influence in my childhood and that then impacted my interest in Ayurveda. So when I moved to Australia, the Australian climate and the flora and fauna here is much harsher and it's much less distinct. The seasons are less distinct, like we don't get the really cold and then transitions are less obvious. But I was fascinated to find out that the indigenous culture, particularly on East Coast Australia, really does follow the same six season cycle through the year and that when you look into it and I'm by no means an expert I don't want to hold myself as an expert on this because I'm not it's something I've just started to really get interested in but when you look into it the way that indigenous culture aboriginal culture understands the seasons is not on a timeline so it's not a calendar like on this date spring begins and on this date we have winter equinox or whatever it's all done according to when particular trees come into leaf or when particular fruits are ripe or when a particular breed of fish starts to swim upstream. I mean, it's just this deep, deep, deep reverence and understanding of the natural world and an attuned sense of that. And of course, this is being impacted by climate change, which is a whole other conversation. But the parallels between that and the Ayurvedic understanding of the seasonal cycles, which is also very much about being connected to land, connected to food source, they're very strong. And so that's something I became quite interested in and have started to study now. There's a teaching in Ayurveda, it's called Ahamkara. Ahamkara is the innate knowing and wisdom of the natural world. And it describes how every living thing understands when it's meant to do what it's meant to do like so for example a baby understands when it's meant to transition from crawling to walking a sunflower seed understands when it's put into the soil when it's time to germinate and start growing into a sunflower i mean it's just beyond a miracle like we can't even begin to comprehend how this stuff works and the seasonal cycles are all part of that story of the innate unfolding of life as a really complex web and an interconnected phenomena. It kind of gives me chills to think about it because it's so powerful and it's part of who we are as human beings. And as we live in more and more disassociated ways, as we live less connected to earth, less connected to the food source, less connected to the seasons and in a more sort of sterile and buffered way, there's a cost to that. We lose something in that disconnect and it's a sad loss, I think. It's a sad loss to many and not just us humans, but every other species on the planet feels that disconnect that humans are, seem to be so very much engaged in, um, mm. sadly, <laughs> at this time. However, you know, I maintain a lot of hope, in, especially during these crises. And as you mentioned earlier, in the beginning of this conversation, there's the opportunities that can come from these big events. I liken it to what you've just so beautifully articulated in the natural intelligence and the miracle of everything in the natural world. And the more and more we can focus on our return to nature, our own true nature, and to nature as a whole and our part in as you said it's all interconnected we're a part of it so 
this also makes my heart sing too, just as you articulated it does for you. And surely perhaps deep down in every single living being. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the really beautiful side impacts of what's happened to us with the coronavirus is a couple of things. I mean, I'm sure seeing the very positive impact on the environment because we're all flying less mm -hmm. and there's a lot less pollution. I mean, that's just amazing to start mm -hmm. things like, you know, seeing the skyline in Delhi or Los Angeles for the first time in 30 years. It's so beautiful. And then the other thing I've noticed, which is really interesting, is a lot of people have had their incomes impacted. Mm. And I'm not commenting at all on people who are on a sort of survival level. That's a very different conversation. Mm. But for many of us, many people I know who've had their incomes impacted, what it's meant really is just needing to amend lifestyle a little bit. It doesn't mean you're going to lose your home or you're going to not be able to put food on the table. It just means a different type of relationship to money and awareness of materialism. Mm. And I think that's a gift. It's really interesting. You know, when I was married, I got divorced a couple of years ago. When I was married, we were materially, financially pretty comfortable and plenty of disposable income. And it was great. You know, it was lovely. And I didn't really have to think that much about money and, and whatever. And then I got divorced and my material situation changed a lot. I was financially dependent on myself and I had a lot less money. And I remember thinking when that shift happened for me, oh, I wonder how this will impact me. Like, I wonder, am I going to really struggle? Am I going to suffer? Will kids suffer? Like being quite anxious about that. And truly, from my heart, it's been the biggest gift. Like, it's not, again, I really want to be clear, I'm not commenting on people who are struggling to feed their families and to put a roof over. That's a very different thing. Mm. But for me to go from just not really thinking about it much to actually just being more mindful and appreciating things more and being a little more careful with how I spend and for my children to understand that you don't just click your fingers and things magically appear that you want. It's been a gift. And I see a lot of people going through that now with Corona where what we're doing is we're spending more time together. We're cooking more meals together. We're making stuff. We're trading and swapping stuff. We're going much more back into community value way of living. And there may be less money, but there's a lot less stress. There's a lot less overload. And I don't know, I think there might be something in that. And I can speak to that from personal experience that I've really actually even enjoyed having less money in my life and feeling the lessening of the pressure that comes with that. Uh, you know, I kind of liken it to this whole concept of consumerism. In some ways, media and advertising just likes to have us believe that we need so much more than we do. And that in itself is a sickness. It's an industry and it's a sickness inside. And when we become free of that <laughs> and there is actually choice, not a dependency, it is a very liberating experience. And I can hear what you're saying that for some, it's sort of perhaps brought that sense of awareness and recognition that we actually don't need as much as we think we mm. do. Something that was amazing for me, I'll quickly share, was when I was out in the wild in Africa, literally out in the wilderness and in the bush, and <laughs> as a, we were told to bring as little because we had to carry, and even then what we needed as a group of seven human beings <laughs> was such a burden compared to a wild animal that just walks completely free and they don't question their path. We spoke about that as well, knowing <laughs> what to do. I guess there is that balance as well as appreciating and understanding survival, but we've got that covered, really. I couldn't agree with you more. I, pretty much every person in our Western culture, certainly here in Australia, mm. is above the poverty line to the mm. point where we can live really good lifestyle in terms of eating well and having our healthcare needs and all that sort of stuff taken care of. We're very, very fortunate. Mm -hmm. This isn't a commentary on people that don't have those privileges of which there are millions yeah. all over in, the world yes. but for us in our western culture at this time Bhagavad Gita the Sanskrit scripture it's very clear Krishna says again and again God in the form of Krishna the material realm will not make you happy you can be a rich man you can be a king you can be the ruler of great countries and your happiness is no more guaranteed than the beggar on the street it's not the answer to happiness. It may help. It may bring opportunity. It may even, if you're wise, afford you the opportunity to help others. 
But mm. in and of itself, material abundance is not a ticket to happiness. And haven't we just seen that? I mean, don't we see that all the time? I had a friend come back from a third world country once and say, oh, how lucky we are, how lucky we are. And a part of me was like, well, yes, because her next comment was, you know, they just don't have the material, the wealth that it is not available there that, as it is to us. And a part of me was sort of, yes, 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 but most often they have the spiritual wealth and we have a <laughs> impoverished, <laughs> that is, there's, for me anyway, the real richness. Mm. Come yeah, um, and you know it's important not to glorify that because you, if you live in real poverty, that's a very different thing. I'm very conscious of that, but I do think that we're not having the conversation enough around. I mean, Gandhi said it perfectly when he said, "There's enough in the world for everyone's mm. need, but not for everyone's greed." It's an addiction, actually. This material culture that we live in, this consumerist culture, it's just an addictive energy. It's a bottomless pit in buddhism it's spoken about as the realm of the hungry ghosts it's like this place of grasping and trying to covet and greed and holding on and that is never lead anywhere other than greater and greater addiction and emptiness mm. and emptiness exactly right exactly right so gunas gunas <laughs> i was reading about these the other day and actually I want to hear what you've got to say about these gunas because they do seem to give a lot of insight as to who we are, why we are, what we are in many different levels. Can you share a little? And you teach about this also in your Ayurvedic course. Yeah, the gunas are, again, energetic principles, energetic principles that are underlying a lot of the experiences that we have in life. And the way that I think about the gunas specifically is they're very much in the area of choices that we make. So there are three gunas. They're sometimes called the modes of being or the modes of living. The first one is tamas. And tamas is any time that we make a choice that is going to pull us away from the light. So any time that we make a choice that takes us deeper into addiction, discomfort, dysfunction. You know, if you make a choice to lie or cheat or steal or you're greedy or gluttonous, any of those types of like really dark qualities, which we all have in us and we all make those choices sometimes, the outcome, the karmic consequence of those choices is never good. It never leads anywhere good. It might lead somewhere good in the moment, but it's never going to lead to long-term good. And then we have rajas, which is where the majority of our human experience resides. Rajas is the path of passion and action. So rajas means I'm going through my life, I'm engaged in activities, and they don't really have a strong karmic flavor. I'm not behaving in a way that's dark and negative and detrimental, but I'm also not really uplifting humanity or myself. I'm just kind of plodding through the motions you know I'm looking after myself I'm looking after my family I'm sort of contributing but there's not really I'm not in alignment with the highest it's action I think about Rajas really as the hamster on the wheel just spinning through and this is where a lot of people live their entire lives actually born and die into this hamster wheel spinning and then the, the last energy is sattva sattva literally means the mode of sweetness and sattva is where we step outside of the hamster wheel and we take action that is for the higher good of ourselves and others. Mm -hmm. And when I say action, it doesn't just mean things that we do. It's our thoughts, our words, and our physical actions. So it's also about intention. If I go into a situation and I'm just thinking about what I can get out of it, that's tamas, that's the darker energy. If I go into a situation completely neutral, that's rajas. And if I go into a situation thinking, what can I contribute? What can I give here? How can I uplift? How can I be of service? That's sattva. And the yogic ideal is that we, as far as possible, align our lives with sattvic choices. So in any given situation, we're doing the best that we can to be of service, to contribute, to make a choice for the greater good. Diet is a really good and simple example. You can eat a tub of Ben and Jerry's ice cream and you might enjoy it in the moment and then you're going to feel pretty tamasic fairly soon afterwards. Mm. It's heavy, it's sugary, it's like it's not going to serve you so well. 
then you can eat food that is just like your average kind of fuel. That's mm -hmm. rajasic, just food that's wholesome, but not necessarily particularly healthy or uplifting. And then you can eat food that would be more in the sattvic category that's very pure, that's very clean, that's very clear, that's good for your body and ethically good too. So perhaps you're choosing not to eat meat or animal products. You're choosing to make choices that aren't going to have a negative impact on the environment. You're thinking about where did the food come from? How was it grown? That would be the more sattvic choice. Mm -hmm. And we can apply it to almost anything that we do. Really is a way of living making personal yeah choice. well everything's a it, it is important i will just say this because i think this is important it's really important when we think about the gunas we can get a bit judgmental we can go back into that thing of oh this is bad and this is good and i only want to do sattvic things and it can make us really judgy like yeah. oh i'm not going to hang out with that person because they eat mcdonald's or <laughs> it's sort of like this holier than thou person of ego. <laughs> yeah and so i'm also very conscious when i speak about the gunas i want to avoid that like it mm. certainly isn't about sitting in judgment of other people in fact mm. Some of the most sattvic people I know aren't actually practicing yogis. They're just kind, decent people. Wow. And I know some people who are yogis who mm. aren't living in a very sattvic way at all because they're full of judgment and resentment. Mm. And so, mm. you know, we have to be careful about how we label ourselves and whether that leads to judgment. That's really beautiful. I want to ask you, Katie, what does having a lion heart mean to you? I have in the highest intention, my greatest goal in this life is to live with courage. I think it's all too easy to not speak up, to not live to the fullest. I always think of Martin Luther King when he said the biggest problem with racism in America during his fight for equality wasn't that most people were racist. He said, most people aren't racist. He said, the biggest problem is that people don't speak out. They just drop their head. They close their eyes down. They don't want to be controversial. They don't want to get into trouble. And so even though their beliefs are good and honorable, they'll let atrocities happen because they don't want to speak out. And there's lots of examples of that throughout history. And so for me to have a lion's heart is to be in courage and to be in courage is to be the person who's brave enough to speak out, to say the truth as I see it, and to be a change maker, even when that might feel confronting and you might feel alone in that quest. Thank you so much, Katie, for everything you've shared today, wisdom, knowledge, experience, personal journeys. It's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate the depth of your questions too. It's always really lovely to be asked questions that have some depth to them. So I, I really appreciate that you've let me go there and talk about Sanskrit and talk about the philosophies and kind of really dive deep. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I hope our listeners will appreciate I'm sure they will because this is where the depth is where mm, the juice is. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you for spending your precious time listening to this podcast. I really do hope that you enjoyed. You can find some helpful links related to the topics we have discussed, download some freebies and join our Lionheart community by visiting our website, lionheartworkshops.com. To view this specific podcast blog, click on podcast at the main menu. Please also share this with friends, hit subscribe and leave us a review so that these ideas can continue to spread. Those pretty little stars help others to find us. The Lionheart Podcast and Lionheart Online Workshops is an online platform and community designed to enhance your health, natural and spiritual well-being. Until next time, please think about how you will embody your Lionheart and reach your highest potential as the amazing human being that you are.